Welcome to the beautiful Blue Earth River Valley and the Rapidan Dam. I'm Commissioner Will Purvis, uh, Blue Earth County Board of Commissioners, and I've been a lifelong resident of this area, and I've been enjoying the Rapidan Dam and the area surrounding it for my entire life. We have a beautiful bike trail that ends at the deck of the Rapidan Dam. We have a wonderful campground and picnic area. The landing where people can take their canoes and their kayaks and go downstream towards Mankato. I have people fishing and enjoying the river behind me. And it's just a wonderful place. And I would like to invite you all to come visit the Rapidan Dam and the, the park and maybe enjoy some time on the bike trail also. Come take a look into the Rapidan Dam and its enduring life in the Blue Earth River Valley. In 1854, the Rapidan area was settled by Basil Moreland with the foresight of having an ideal location to develop mills. It became a large milling area with the first flour mill built in 1866. The town site of Rapidan Mills was then platted here in what is now the reservoir area. At the time, it was a thriving community, which was advantageous when the land was sold to the Billsby Company, known in Minnesota as Consumer Power Company. They acknowledged that Mankato needed electrical power to grow as a manufacturing center in southern Minnesota. So when the opportunity arose, they decided it was the perfect place to build a dam due to the Blue Earth River Gorge and falling rapids. Construction of the dam began in March of 1910, led by Amberson Hydraulic Construction Company of Boston, who owned the patent to this hollow steel reinforced dam design. Local workers were hired as fast as they applied, but there were not enough men in the area to complete the job so additional workers were brought in from Chicago. 350 men and 48 teams of horses were hired because at the time, everything had to be built and transported by horse or hand. Workers cleared the reservoir of trees and the existing buildings were used as boarding houses for the laborers. Even the existing mill turbine was used to generate lighting and operate stone crushers during the dam's construction. When the dam was completed, the, all the buildings in Rapidan Mills was put up for auction and sold off and they had to be moved off. Two of these buildings survived that we know of for sure and they can be seen. One is the dam store and the other one is the residential house next to it. Local materials were harvested for the construction. Concrete was poured by hand at a rate of 170 cubic yards per day into wooden frames totaling 20,000 cubic yards of concrete by completion. The wood grain from the frames is still visible on the dam's interior walls. Only one man died during construction, Hugo Hein, a 40-year-old North Mankato resident with six children. Hein was working on top of cribbing when one of the cables used to pulley buckets of concrete across the gorge got caught on his platform, throwing him from the 50-foot high crib. Coincidentally, Hein had carved his name inside the dam just a few days earlier. His descendants still live in the Mankato area. Working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, laborers finished construction of the dam in only one year. Tests were run by December of 1910, and electricity was first sent to the Mankato area March 11, 1911. The early onset of electricity in the area was a major factor in the growth of Mankato. The 1.5 megawatts of electricity generated in March of 1911 doubled the amount previously supplied in Mankato and for half the expense. In 1930, it was said that only 10% of the rural community had electricity. So this area was very fortunate. If you had your farm next to the line, you could hook up to the line and have electricity. So there was people here with electrical power in the 19-teens. This put Southern Minnesota ahead of the nation where the majority of people had to wait for the Rural Electrification Administration to come in the 1940s before they were supplied with electrical power. Electricity was so new at this time that most people didn't even know what to use it for. It became the mission of Consumer Power Company to teach people the benefits of using an electric iron and refrigerator, things that were widely unheard of at the time. Three bridges have crossed the Blue Earth River at this point. The first, built of wood and iron in 1878, was big for its time and invaluable to the area because it served as the only way to cross the river. But by 1910, there were holes in the planks and the old iron bridge needed to be replaced. So when the Rapidan Dam was built, it was with the agreement that there would be a one-lane bridge on top. This new road eliminated steep banks on either side of the river, which had caused difficulty for many early travelers 
traversing the land in horse-drawn carts. By 1983, a two-lane bridge was past due, and the current County Road 9 bridge was constructed. Today, the old road atop the dam is used by tourists and for dam maintenance. In 1949, the Rapidan Dam made newspapers nationwide when the Cray Elevator was transported eight miles from Cray Corners to Rapidan. This was a 40-ton structure. It was 65 feet tall. It measured 24 feet by 24 feet. It approached the dam, and early Sunday morning, it moved onto the dam. The first obstacle they found was that the elevator had to be jacked up seven feet to go over the dam railings. Now, there was quite a crowd that showed up that Sunday morning to see this. Um, I've heard various reports, some came just to see it coming over the dam, and others came because they thought that the elevator for sure would fall over the dam. <laughs> but it did cross successfully. It took all day to move the elevator across the dam, and then it was slowly taken up the hill. You can still see this elevator in Rapidan. It is still standing and still in use today. The Rapidan Dam operated smoothly until 1965 when the spring rain and thaw coincided to create a 500-year flood. A flood with such magnitude, it happens only once in a 500-year period. Sheets of ice were propelled into the dam's intake, damaging seven of the gates. The powerhouse was flooded with three feet of water, but even then, the generators managed to run for a short time. Right now we're looking at roughly 4,000 CFS, that's cubic feet of water per second, uh, going through the dam. Now, 1,200 of that is going through the generators themselves. Everything above that is going through our tainer gates. The flood of 65 brought an astonishing 43,295 CFS and caused destruction to the amount of $100,000 per gate, plus the cost of generating equipment. At this time, the dam was under the same ownership, although Consumer Power Company had changed its name to Northern States Power by this time, and they considered the damage to be a total loss. NSP abandoned the dam, leaving it vacant for 20 years. In 1983, under the ownership of Blue Earth County, the dam was renovated and returned to use as a hydroelectric plant. Buttresses were strengthened, new tainter gates were installed, and the powerhouse was updated. Two new generators and turbines were installed, upping the capacity to 5.5 megawatts. In 2002, Another round of repairs was needed when water falling over the dam deteriorated the concrete apron below. Without a solid apron, water had begun directly hitting the sandstone beneath the dam, eroding the foundation and continuing upstream. The Army Corps of Engineers was called in on an emergency basis to help fill the 25-foot hole of erosion with 3,000 cubic yards of concrete. The aprons are now under constant surveillance and will require continual maintenance. Additional improvements were also made in 2003, 2007, and 2010. In 2007, the Rapidan Dam made publications again, when historian Jane Targison nominated it for Minnesota 150, the people, places, and things that shape our state. The Rapidan Dam was selected from more than 2,700 entries to become one of the Min 150. From the outside, the dam is a massive looming structure, roaring with the rapid flow of the Blue Earth River. North American Hydro, a private company, owns the generating equipment and operates the dam on a daily basis. North American Hydro is the largest independent power producer in the Midwest, providing services industry-wide to companies of all sizes. However, the dam itself is owned by Blue Earth County, who performs routine repairs and maintains the reservoir area. The uh, river here has a watershed that feeds water to it of about 2,300 square miles that reaches south, east, west, and then south all the way into Iowa, actually. So that 2,300 square miles is quite a large watershed. The dam is 475 feet long and 87 feet tall from the river bottom to the bridge deck. Excess water spills through the tainter gates and crashes down 70 feet behind the dam. The objective is, of course, to utilize all the water that passes through but with the generators capable of 1,200 CFS total, there's often excess water that does not end up in the generating process. 
The intake area is the start of the generating process. The intake has a grate. This grate's purpose is to separate the water from the debris floating in it. So nothing gets caught in the turbine, gets caught on the generating equipment. The water comes through these grates and flows through an S-shaped draft tube is what it's called. Spinning a turbine, which is attached to a shaft, spinning the generator, which in turn creates electricity. All the debris that gets caught up on these has to be pulled out by the rake. Removing debris is a daily battle. Timber, root balls, leaves, dead fish, beaver huts, ice and garbage continually block the 40-foot deep intake grates. If the debris is too large to remove by hand, North American Hydro has to act quickly. Generators need to be shut down and cranes brought to the bridge deck to hoist out the debris. In the fall, grates need to be raked out four to five times a day due to the falling leaves. Ice is the primary nuisance in spring, popping up erratically with the rushing water of the annual thaw. In 2010, during a spring flow of 22,000 CFS, sheets of ice two and a half feet thick were slammed into the intake, bending a steel I-beam. Occasionally, if there is too much ice to contend with, power is shut down for a day to clear it out. If machinery within the dam requires maintenance, dewatering gates are used to block the flow of water so the work can be done. These solid barriers are dropped into slots on the top and bottom of the dam using a crane, then jacked down with a hydraulic jack. Once the flow is blocked, the remaining water inside the turbines can be pumped out and the repairs can be done without flooding the powerhouse. Once the energy is produced, it's collected by rings and sent to substations near the top of the dam. From there it goes to the XL Energy Transformer, where it runs directly into the XL Energy Grid. With both generators running at full capacity, enough energy is produced to power two to 3,000 houses. Inside the dam, you're faced with 113 graded steps, leading you down to the powerhouse, where two generators, turbines, and other equipment are at work with a loud rumble. Each of the two generators has a capacity of 600 CFS, but they require a minimum of 100 CFS to operate. In a drought situation where there's less than 100 CFS, the generators will not produce power and are therefore shut down. To reroute the remaining minimal river flow, all of the water is passed through this pipe, which can carry 97 CFS. In extreme droughts, the entire Blue Earth River will pass through this one pipe. Reminders of the dam's earlier days can be seen as you walk through the dark, damp corridor. A walkway that spans the length of the dam is sectioned off by 12 buttresses, each with an octagonal passageway. Inside the dam, the air remains comfortably cool all year round. You can hear the boisterous rush of water overhead, and your words echo within the enormous cavity. On a monthly basis, my job duty involves me taking very precise measurements of each crack that is located inside this dam. Uh, those are recorded and then forwarded on to my company, which then submits those to the Federal Energy Regulatory Committee. The same with the seepage wells underneath the dam. A uh, instrument called the piezometer is dropped down into it. Um, when the piezometer end touches water, it gives us a beep. By measuring the distance that the water is from the, the walkway here, it lets us know how much seepage is underneath the dam. Also, we do a grounds inspection looking for anything new. Any kind of seepage or leakage that includes not only the concrete, but downstream of the concrete, upstream of the concrete, we look for river washout. Anything that could potentially be a hazard has been identified and it's being monitored. Aside from the standard expansion and contraction due to temperatures, Dam monitoring has shown no significant changes. Ironically, during a flood situation, the interior of the dam is drier than normal. The pressure put on the dam by the flood water actually strengthens the dam, sealing up minuscule cracks to stop the minimal water leakage that commonly drips down. In 1970, Blue Earth County gained ownership of the dam from NSP in an unlikely twist, found in the fine print of a 1910 agreement. NSP came to the county and pointed out there was an agreement between Blue Earth County and the Billsby Company that the county could use the dam as a highway crossing over the river so long as the facility was used to generate electricity. If it wasn't used to generate electricity, then the dam and the reservoir area would become the property of Blue Earth County. Well, since 1965 it hadn't generated electricity, NSP didn't plan on installing generators, so they went back to the county and said, here, under that 1900 agreement, 
it's yours. And they provided $100,000 as a transition, but that's basically how the county got ownership of the dam and the reservoir. The county receives one cent per kilowatt hour from a renewable energy incentive program. This amounts to approximately $170,000 to $180,000 per year. But even with an additional $20,000 annually from a renewable energy contract with North American Hydro, it's not necessarily a moneymaker for the county when you factor in repairs and maintenance expenses. Conversely, it would cost $20 to $22 million to remove the dam. There are a few different entities keeping their eyes on the dam. Because it's on public water, it's regulated by the Minnesota DNR. And since it generates electricity, it requires licensing from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. The acquisition of the land surrounding the dam came after the 2002 emergency repair of concrete aprons. Workers needed access behind the dam, and the current landowners were very accommodating. However, when the county tried to purchase just that section of land, the owners proposed an all-or-nothing deal. The county, knowing they'd need access in the future for apron maintenance, agreed to the deal and purchased the land using the DNR Natural Scenic Lands Program and private donations. The surrounding conservation land is one of the few remnants of the big woods in southern Minnesota and has since become a popular tent campground nestled within the county's park system. Visitors can bike the Red Jacket Trail, riding from Mankato to Rapidan. Canoes and kayaks are launched from a landing within the campground, where people set off for a swift but beautiful paddle down the river to a second canoe landing located near County Road 90. The Rapidan Dam undeniably forged the future of southern Minnesota. It propelled a rural milling area onto the forefront of renewable energy and hydroelectric production. Having predated most of our area's current residents, it's more than a historical landmark. It's a cherished memory of days gone by and a peaceful scenic stop for new visitors along the way.